This episode is brought to you by Roundtable Group, the experts on experts. We've been connecting attorneys with experts for over 25 years. Find out more at roundtablegroup.com. Thank you for joining us today at Discussions at the Roundtable. I'm your host, Michelle Lux. Today, my guest is Bob Sherwood. He is the president of Smart Text Corporation. Thanks, Bob, for joining me. If you could give me a little bit of background of what it is that you do and how you got your start as an expert witness. Well, I've been in the technology business for about 40 years, worked in Silicon Valley for quite a while, developed products. In fact, I developed uh, the company that I work for, developed all the software we're looking at in this computer screen. It's a 16.7 million colors. We wrote the software for Apple and IBM. Now, I got into this uh, business because uh, I, after one of the companies I started went public, uh, my wife and I are both from the Midwest. We decided to come back to the Midwest for a couple of years. When I was back here, I got a call from a local law firm, and they said, uh, we need an expert witness that has a combination knowledge of good technical experience and financial experience. I taught finance at Stanford, KU, and MU, so I had both. I did had no idea when I started what an expert witness was, except from watching TV. I didn't have a clue. Uh, in fact, when they asked me, I, I started asking, what, what do I do? You know, what am I supposed to do? And as it turned out, I was lucky because the law firm that we eventually worked with was in Washington, D.C. They were a big law firm and they put their experts through extensive training. So, for example, they brought in a psychologist and told us how to dress. They brought in, uh, we did proxies on, on. I had no idea what was going on, but they had all these people around and telling us how to dress, how to look, you know, uh, how to sit in the courtroom, how to respond to questions. So I went through this extensive training, uh, not even knowing where the training would lead me, but it was just training for trial. And what happened was uh, we won the trial, we won the case, and it was turned out it was a prominent law firm. I didn't really understand that at the time. And because of that, other people started hiring me because this prominent law firm kind of blessed me, right, and put me through the training. So then I, that's how I knew what expert witnesses even do. You can tell that the law firms, when they put that time into the testimony and preparing you, um, that that's where it's going to go for them. And so they're definitely doing that in the beginning to make for sure that you're ready and trained. Uh, do you, have you found just over the course of your career as an expert witness that that's offered at different levels from different law firms for training for testimony. Michelle, I, I think you've nailed one of the big distinctions in law firms. And, and I can tell you that the law firms that I work with, and I'll call them major law firms. And let's say a major law firm has got, you know, several hundred lawyers. Uh, they, they will spend extensive amount of time prepping their experts for depositions. And I find out that uh, without being critical of the smaller law firms, maybe they're on tighter budgets, but they don't they don't they don't usually spend as much time prepping you. And uh, the big law firms and some of them have you know really unlimited budgets. They'll put you they'll put you through everything. For example, I just went through a trial uh, four or five months ago, and the law firm hired another lawyer who every day when we're prepping for the trial would put us through trial questions. I mean, he would bring us to tears, basically. <laughs> you know, he would humiliate, intimidate us, and uh, and he was harsh. But when we finally went to trial, I mean, we were all prepared. And yeah. so, yeah, that you you nailed it. And that is the distinction in the preparation side is significant. So, for example, uh, one of the questions I always ask the law firms during the interview process is, "Do you prep your?" Uh, experts and how much time you spend doing it. And because uh, that's a key thing for me, I, I just don't think you can be good at an expert unless you get good prep by a law firm. What do you think is your best um, thing that you've taken away from those that preparation? Like what is something that maybe you've applied outside the courtroom that's useful to you? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, you practice listening, even though my, my wife says I'm not a good listener. Uh, <laughs> You, you do work on listening a lot, and you you really work on listening to the the specifics of the question. And, you know, the classic question is, you know, do you know what time it is? And the the good expert says yes, and the amateur says four thirty. They didn't he didn't answer the question, so that's kind of a classic example, but uh, of listening, right? Uh, 
so that's probably one thing I've learned is, is listen carefully to the question and only answer the question. Do not answer information beyond the question, because if the lawyer wants you to answer more, guess what? He'll ask you another question. You did touch on initial interview questions that you yeah. ask. What else do you ask the attorney when you're trying to learn about the case in front of you? Well, first, uh, my my procedures, I try to prepare very well. I really do believe in doing your homework. So if I have an interview, uh, I'll probably spend anywhere from one to maybe five hours preparing for the interview. I'm going to read the complaint in detail. I'm going to read any other documents they've given me in detail. I'm going to not only read them, I'm going to study them. I'm going to examine them as if I were going to be questioned about them. I want to go into the interview knowing the background material on the case for, for several reasons. But uh, so I prepare extensively for a, for an interview, even if it's, a, you know, a minor interview where, you know, you only have maybe 30 minutes. I, I prepare for it, and I think that's that's very, very important. I don't, I don't think a lot of experts do it. Generally, you know what they're going to ask you, right? They're going to ask you something about your background. They don't want to know where you were born necessarily, but they want to know what's relevant. And they also want to know, the typical question is, please match your background with the issues of the case. So you know that question is coming. If you don't have a prepared answer for it, then you're not doing a good job for the interview. I've coached other experts that, that have got into the business, and I said, you know, you have to prepare much more than you think you should because you know what they're going to ask you. And if you don't have a good prepared answer, then you're not going to do a good job. Right. Now, reading a little bit more about some of your background, um, you did write software for contracts for, for the attorneys. What about your own contract? Do you add any special terms now that you've been, you know, expert witness business for a while? Are there things that you have added along the way that are very important to include in that contract? Well, there's some things I always delete if I see them. One is liquidated damages. Uh, one is insurance requirements. Uh, in terms of adding positive things, I usually always add that if I'm not paid, according to the agreement, which might be net 30 or net 15, whatever it might be, if I'm not paid and I advise them that I'm not paid and they don't, they don't recover the money or, you know, ref, you know, pay me within a certain length of time, then I reserve the right to stop work. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of experts don't do that, but I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the attorney stop work. If they don't get paid, they usually stop. I'm no different. Uh, I, I basically can sell my time and my brain, uh, but I expect to be paid for it. Why would you um, hesitate on the insurance piece of it for a contract? Uh, mainly because the insurance, uh, they might have a requirement that's unreasonable, for example. Maybe they want $2 million or $3 million of insurance. That may be more than I want to carry. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I want to be very careful about any anything where they're requiring me to incur an expense that's additional to what I already carry. Mm -hmm. Now, most of them don't have insurance provisions, but some of them do. And, and many of the brokers that, that, that help experts get business have liquidated damages clauses. And, and those are things that uh, I recommend experts just don't sign, don't sign any kind of damage clause. And those now, things are new, by the way, brokers are just adding those kind of things now. Well, one of the base questions is, what do you know now that you wish you knew the first time as an expert witness? I wish I would have known that uh, get a team. And I would say that's kind of like the message. Get a team early. And when I started, I thought I had to do everything. Check my sites, check my documents, uh, check every if every URL was right. Well, that's not a good way for an expert to spend their time. There are people that can do that faster, better, and 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 and, and they're better at it than an expert. So I I I what I about halfway through my whole expert witness career. I got my team together. Now, the team for me consists of the following. At least two good researchers. An expert shouldn't spend his time researching Google on some issue. Uh, you can hire a researcher for pro a good researcher for one-fourth what you hire the expert for, and they do a good job. So I have two researchers, and, and I've used them for now for probably 10 or 15 years now. You, you, usually, I always have on my team one good deep-dive computer programmer. Yes, I can write software, 
but the software gets more complicated every day and it takes a lot more specific experience. So I have a deep dive computer programmer that I use, right? And then the last part of my team, uh, yeah, researchers, a deep dive computer programmer is an editor. I mean, I mean yeah, I, I'm a good writer. Uh, I've written a few books, uh, but there are editors that are absolutely unbelievable. And if you get a good editor on your team, your report's going to look five times better, and you're not going to spend a lot of time on the, on the commas and the periods and the semicolons, mm -hmm. even if you can do that. An editor can do it faster, better, and, and uh, I've edited my own document and then given it to an editor, and it comes back, it looks like somebody bled on it. <laughs> you know, there's so many, <laughs> so many corrections. And I thought, oh, I thought I got every comma there. No, I missed like 36 commas. Wow. But that's their business. So what I mean is you get a team so that you can focus on your business, which is being an expert, knowing the technology, understanding how to go into a deposition. And you get these other people around you. So let me kind of close it with this. When I first started, I thought, oh, gee, I have to do all these things myself. And then I realized that some of these things I'm not good at. There are other people better. So I started getting my team. And then I realized the lawyer said, it's fine. You know, get your team. Bill us for their work. We understand they're cheaper than you are. We'd rather have them editing than you edit. Now I don't have any problem. Now every job I start, I say, I've got my team. If I use them, I bill you for it. Kind of leads into another question and you kind of mm -hmm. answered it already is how do you organize yourself? And are there other maybe productivity tools that you apply keeping track of maybe multiple cases that come your way? To me, there's two parts to that. Uh, the, the first thing is organizing it on your calendar, for example, and the calendar might have the report date, the draft report date, any important dates that you're going to have to produce something. So I use a kind of a method that uh, Intel used to use in Silicon Valley, and that's the red, yellow, green method. So if a, if a report is due February the 4th, I'll put that on my calendar in red. That means it has to be done on the 4th. If it's a if research have to be done, then maybe I'll put that in, in, in yellow. If it's just discovery, I'll put it in green. So now when I look at my calendar, I'll have three colors. The red, I know I've got to do in those dates. I can't put it off. You know, the green is, is dates that I want to meet, but I could probably miss and not be in trouble. And the yellow is discovery date. So the first part is organizing the material on my calendar based on what the lawyer has told me on their timeline. That's the first part of it right now. The second part, as far as organizing the documents, I'm going to go back to my editor again, because in my case, my editor actually is my document manager. So when documents come in, they'll go to my editor. That editor will, will start creating folders for each, each project we work on, right? And, she'll, and we have a kind of a template. We have the administration area. That's one area of the folder, the invoicing area. The area where documents are sent to to me, that would be a documents received by me, and those go by dates. So if I receive twenty documents on February fourteenth, my editor will put that into a folder February fourteenth. If I receive more on February twenty first, so we organize the documents by the time it by the date at which we received them. Now there's another way to do it. We used to do it by type of document: complaint, reply, report. And we now prefer to do it by timeline because when we're trying to find out what we did, we usually think about when we did it. Mm. So the, the acid test for us on a document is when did we actually get that? Oh, February. Fine. So let's go in the February folder. So we organize by timeline. Interesting. Now, can I ask you, have you had any litigation matters in artificial intelligence? I mean, it's kind of a hot topic right now, but have you seen it come across your desk? Uh, yes, I have not actually been interviewed for a specific AI project, but there are a lot of projects that that come within that buzzword, but aren't pure AI projects. They're just projects where you're feeding back information to a database. The database is making modifications. So the next person that interrogates that database and has the latest information before it spits out another answer, right? So uh, but but I'll tell you, kind of, you didn't exactly ask this, but I'll tell you the part of the litigation business that seems to me is taking off again is patent litigation. Uh, there's so many uh, patents out there now. I mean, I think last year there was 300,000 patents issued, 300,000, right? 
And uh, a lot of law firms look at that as uh, opportunities. So yeah, I, I get, I probably get, get interviewed for a patent once at once a week or once every two weeks. Wow. What's some, um, maybe thinking back on your, your cases mm -hmm. that you've worked on, what are some insights that you have taken away from them or maybe was an aha moment for you as an mm -hmm. expert witness? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a trial uh, incident that just happened that I think is is beneficial for experts to like hear about and so i am testifying at a trial and there's another expert and this other expert is now on the witness stand his name let's just call him jack so it's easier to talk about so jack's on the witness stand so his attorney now is asking jack questions and jack and these questions that the attorney is asking him clearly are binary type questions he wants the witness to just say yes or no this witness, very knowledgeable person, uh, written a couple of books, uh, kind of a, I call him a professorial Santa Claus looking kind of guy. Every time he get a question, he couldn't stop talking. And so the, the, the judge started admonishing him and said, he'd say, Jack, just answer the lawyer's question. Don't, you know, go on and, 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 and do like an epiphany or something. But he just kept doing it. And he kept doing it. So he gets admonished maybe four or five times. So he loses what? All credibility with the jury. So the, the insight is, and, and, and I learned almost that the hard way is when you're at a trial and your lawyer is asking you questions, right? You don't have to guess what he wants. You just answer the question. He knows what he wants. He will get you there. One more point about that that I think is very insightful. Sometimes an expert gets asked a question on the witness stand under oath, and the witness knows that what he's going to reply, because he has to be truthful, is negative to his client. What should he do? He replies negative to his client because he can trust that his lawyer under cross will clear that up. And I've had experts that I've talked to, they say, what do I do? I mean, I'm going to have to say something that's negative. I said, don't worry about it. What you need to do is answer truthfully. Your lawyer will come back to you and ask you to explain it, but don't explain it yourself. Then it acts like you're, oh gosh, I just said something negative about my client. I better clear it up by now saying something positive. That's not what an expert should do. So, uh, you know, one of the first rules I tell you, and you, you, I'm sure Michelle, you know this, and you always tell the truth. And I find out that that experts think about that but still get nervous. And I've learned that if you just focus on that, you'd get less nervous. See, when I go on a witness stand, I don't have to worry about anything. If I know the answer, I answer it. If I don't know, I say, I don't know. Because I can trust my lawyer to ask me questions because the lawyer's job is, he is the proponent of a client. The expert isn't. I'm a proponent of truthfulness, if you will, right? So be truthful. Let your lawyer be the advocate for your client. Do you find that also just going back to, you know, mock, you know, prep time and everything in the cross-examination, that conversation usually comes up, right? With your own attorney of like, hey, you're going to go with this. I'm going to lead you with this. The other attorney is going to do a cross, but I'm going to take you back here. Is that talked about before you get on the stand? Yeah. This is a great observation on your part, because again, it's only talked about with lawyers that have good prep. Mm -hmm. Just recently, for example, I was being prepped and the lawyer asked me a question. And I answered it. And, and the lawyer said, well, that's, that's negative for the client. And I said, well, you asked the question. I answered it. If you want clarification, then you ask me another question. But don't ask me to change my reply when I hear that question, because I'm not going to be thinking about, oh, sure, uh, when I answered this in prep, I answered it this way, and that was negative, because I, I'm not going to remember all that. So if you ask me a question, I'm going to tell the truth. It's going to be negative to your client. It's your job as a lawyer to clear that up, not me. I don't have to do that. I am not, even though it's the great irony, right? I'm paid by the same client. I'm theoretically not an advocate of the client. I want to put the client in the best light I can within truthfulness and within the expert technology that I have, but I'm not an advocate for the client. 
Now, what about any last stories you'd like to share with us about being an expert witness? One that I one that I recall now is uh, uh, I was testifying actually for Yahoo, as a matter of fact, and the other the other attorney was really uh, hard on me, and he got real personal, right? And uh, but I didn't, you know, I didn't take it personal because I knew that was his job, and and I think uh, if there's a story in there, it's that experts should kind of realize that no matter how tough the question is, how personal it gets, you know, such as, aren't you paid by the client or aren't you paid for your opinion? Never take those things personal. And, and what happens is, is many of the lawyers recognize what they're doing. In this particular case, when the trial was over, the lawyer came out and apologized. He said, he said I'm really sorry. I said, yeah, I understand. I said, that's, that's your job. You see, yeah, I'm really sorry. Well, guess what? About three years later, that same law firm hired me on other cases. So, so what I mean is if you don't take it personal, you realize just doing your job, they know their job. They're happy to find out, by the way, that the expert knows his job or her job. And they'll come back to you in, in, uh, in better business in the future. So if there's an insight there for future for experts, it's that it's amazing if you don't take these things personal, if you just realize people are doing their jobs, uh, they may come back and hire you for more work two or three years later because they recognize you understand that. Right. Being professional at being an expert witness. <laughs> well, Robert, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on our show. Michelle, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your questions. I hope this was valuable to your uh, listeners and your and your viewers and the people that listen to your podcast. So. Um, Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Discussions at Roundtable. Our show notes are available on our website, roundtablegroup.com. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening apps. 